Chapter 6, Make Believe. Never Trust a Zombie. By me, Paul Brody. Allow me to read this chapter to you. Act like you've never been here before and you know what I'm doing. If you haven't been here before and you don't know what I'm doing, go back and read. Like Go go start at the beginning and get chapter 1. Uh, it's, it's here on the channel. Um, if you have already been through the previous five chapters... Here we go. Chapter 6. Make believe. It is beautiful outside. The air temperature is perfect and the sun is shining. We talk about entertainment likes and dislikes for nearly the entire walk. Some people don't put a lot of stock into music preferences as a way of way to judge someone's personality, but I can't think of many better ways to do it. Me? I'm stuck in the late 90s for music preferences, mostly. I was barely walking when most of the, what I listened to was written. I think the music to, I think the music then was more authentic than what is being written today. I wonder if every generation feels that way. I do listen to some contemporary stuff in spite of all of that. Rachel is into most music. She prefers country and folk. Having grown up in the South, that makes sense. And now being in Texas, she fits in well in this regard. After some friendly teasing about some of each other's votes for best albums ever, we agree upon No Doubt's Tragic Kingdom as the all-time greatest album that we can agree upon. I give her a list of bands to look into. She even records a few of the band names into her phone to look up later. Beyond music, we briefly discuss movies and find vastly different interests there. I love a good horror movie. Rachel says she never watches them at all. I think comedies are also pretty brilliant. While she prefers musicals and anything made prior to the 1960s. We finally hit television shows by the time we get to my house. The walk seems shorter than when shorter when talking with Rachel. As I reach the doorknob, I remember my mom. She's going to get all kinds of excited when she sees I brought a girl home on my second day of a new school. I should have prepared Rachel for mom's line of questioning that will likely ensue. We enter the house. Mom, I'm home, I call. How was your day? She calls back, likely from the office. Not bad. I brought a friend home with me, I say. Rather than a verbal response, we hear a chair moving and then footsteps down the hall. Mom appears around the corner, head first, meaning she was leaning, not diving, but clearly impatient for the extra second it would have taken to fully walk around the wall before looking for who was there. Her eyes get big when she sees Rachel and then she smiles. Hello, dear. Welcome to our house. She takes Rachel's hand and shakes it vigorously. Mom, this is Rachel Sutton. Rachel, this is my mom, Nancy Sterling, I say. Hello, Mrs. Sterling. Pleasure to meet you. Rachel is very polite, taking the hand, shaking like a pro. So, Rachel, tell me about yourself, Mom says. Mom, that's not why she's here. <coughs> I coughed. Rachel didn't, or Eric didn't. Uh... Mom, that's not why she's here, I say. We have homework to do. We'll have to save your 20 questions for another day. I don't want to spend the afternoon doing homework alone while Mom talks with Rachel. Well, how about that, Mom says, with an air of having taken offense. Maybe she has, but I don't think so. It's all right, Eric. I don't mind introducing myself. Rachel is more diplomatic than I am. I'm originally from Atlanta. My family moved here about two years ago. My dad runs a ranch. My mom is a scientist, but she doesn't work anywhere anymore. Cranston has been a bit of a culture shock for me, but it seems like it is getting better with time. My favorite color is orange. I like baseball. I'm undecided about what I want to study in college, but I do plan on going. I think fresh pineapple is the greatest food on the planet. I'm impressed. Mom is too. Either, rehe either you rehearse that in front of the mirror each night, or you're a girl who really knows what she likes and wants. Did you know Eric has a hard time deciding what to eat for breakfast most of the time? Mom is good at keeping a straight face, so she doesn't betray her joke like Rachel's mom did this morning. Thanks, Mom, I say, but it isn't really a struggle for me. I just eat whatever you prepare. I don't think that really helps my case any, now that I've said it out loud. Smiling, Rachel says, he hadn't told me about his breakfast and decisiveness yet, obviously. I wouldn't be here if I knew that about him. Rachel apparently can keep a joke going. She must get that from her dad. Mom laughs. I like you, Rachel. Are you staying for dinner? Please tell me Eric invited you to stay for dinner. He did invite me, but I have to get home earlier rather than later in order to work on an assignment I need to make up from last week. I was sick and missed some school. But thank you for inviting me, Rachel says. That's too bad that you can't stay. And about you being sick last week. Are you all better now? Was it the flu? Mom looks very concerned. We don't think it was the flu, but something viral, probably. We should be all better now. We being me and my parents, we were all hit with it. I won't get you sick. My mom cleared me to go back to school, so she's not worried about us being contagious. Rachel seems very comfortable talking with my mom. I hope that means she's really comfortable with me. She certainly doesn't seem as edgy as she did around Trent and Jesse. Well, that's good. Not that I was worried. You said your mom was a scientist? Mom asks. Yes, well, she has her MD, but she has also specialized in virology. That's what she was last working on with the CDC. Rachel pauses momentarily, as though she had said something she wished she hadn't. But that's all I know about it. <clears throat> she did that before, acted like she said something she shouldn't have. Maybe mentioning the CDC invites a lot of questions that she just doesn't know the answers to. 
Maybe she regrets mentioning it as soon as she says it. Wow, from the CDC to Cranston. That must have been a change. She isn't here investigating some weird viral outbreak, is she? Mom asks excitedly. She loves those movies where some form of disease spreads rapidly around the world. Kind of odd, if you ask me. But then I love those kinds of movies where an alien force invades the planet and, ha and a handful of super people fight them off. Meanwhile, whole cities fall victim to the battle and are seemingly written off as acceptable casualties. There's definitely something incongruous between Hollywood and reality. Rachel is more timid now. No, nothing like that. Nothing that I'm aware of. Too bad. That would be a great story. Enliven this place up a bit, Mom says. Yeah, Mom. It's too bad we didn't move to a rural town with a fatal disease going around and no, no known way of combating it. What a jip, I say. Mom laughs, but Rachel doesn't. Maybe her mom is here to study something. That would probably explain any strangeness. If the community knew about knew about it, I think that would certainly explain the coldness towards the Suttons. The locals wouldn't want the attention or whatever would result from their secret being exposed. Rachel must know more than she is saying, or it's just my preference for conspiracy, reaching a peak once again. Mom likes disease outbreak stories, and I like conspiracies that cover them up. I guess we aren't so different in preferences as we are in, as we are in perspective. So what kind of homework are you two working on? Some kind of project? Mom asks. Nah, just doing homework at the same time in the same location, I say. Rachel nods in agreement. Okay, well, I'll be in the office if you need anything. Nice to meet you, Rachel. I hope you can come over for dinner sometime. Maybe we can have your parents over, too. I'd like to get to know some people around town as well, Mom says. Sure, that sounds fine. We'll have to plan something sometime. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Sterling. Want to go to the kitchen table? Asks Rachel. Uh, sure, that sounds fine. Whatever you prefer, she answers. Mom retreats to the office, and I lead Rachel through to the kitchen. I drop my bag on the table. There's more room to shuffle books around or whatever. Would you like something to drink? Soda, juice, water? I ask. Water would be great, thank you, she says. Are you hungry at all? Just a snack of some kind? Popcorn chips or anything? I offer as I retrieve our filtered pitcher from the fridge. <clears throat> I'm fine, just water, thank you, Rachel says. Sure, on its way. I fill up a couple of cups for us and then empty a bag of nacho cheese flavored chips into a bowl. Chips here if you change your mind, but be quick about it. I, may, I might eat them all myself. Have at it, she says, giving a wave of disinterest. For a few minutes, we behave like we were at a library or in a controlled study hall. Neither of us speaks. We just do homework. I'll be honest, my intent on inviting Rachel over to do homework wasn't to do, actually do homework, but to spend time with her instead, hopefully talking and getting to know her. I need something to break the ice now. Do you understand the assignment for writing? Does she want us to write our own poem similar to the one on page 173, or are we supposed to analyze the one we read? We read. I understand the assignment, but I want to get a conversation rolling. I'm pretty sure we are supposed to write our own poem of a similar, na similar nature, you know, with a moral to it, Rachel says, and then looks up at me from her science text. Her green eyes pop against the pale skin. She is still unusually pale for the people in this area, but she looks more energized than she did yesterday. Even her hair seems to have more volume today than yesterday. Hair volume? Did I just notice and make an observation on hair volume? At least I didn't say something about it out loud. I shake the hair volume thought out of my head and say, okay, that sounds right. I just got confused by the way I wrote it down, I guess. Do you have any idea what you were going to write about? I'm encouraged by the eye contact. I want to keep this conversation developing. Actually, I already wrote it. I did it during a lecture in social science. I write a lot of poetry as a hobby, so it isn't much of a task for me to put something together for a class assignment, she says coolly. I'm impressed. Outside of school, I don't think I've ever I'm, outside of school, I don't think I've ever even read a poem, let alone wrote, wrote one, unless you count songs, which I don't, and you knocked it out same day during another class. Not bad at all. I hope I'm not coming across as over anxious in my praise, just to be safe, I add. That is, unless the poem is bad. I haven't actually read it, so I don't know. Maybe I should reserve judgment until I've heard it. I smile invitingly. I hope that's how it comes across anyway. Hmm. I'm not so concerned about what other people think about my poetry that I can be sucked into your little game, Eric. But if you'd like to see how good my poetry is, you can read it if you want. She hands her notebook over to me and then leans back in her chair. We are sitting directly across from one another at the table in the kitchen. It is square. It sits four comfortably. We've only eaten our meals here so far since the move. Perhaps if we ever have company over for dinner, we'll use the dining room. I read Rachel's poem. What changes the body changes the mind. From changes, results that you sometimes can't find. Looking out from within acts to distort your view, but looking in from without presents its own bind, and in either direction the changes are true, with the end result that you find yourself new. Wow, that reads like a real poem. I don't know if I understand it, though. I'm not much for poetry. I try to be reassuring, but mostly I'm apologetic. It might not mean anything, she says reassuringly. That's the beauty of poetry. We both laugh a bit, but I'm not sure I know why. I ask, so does it mean anything? Rachel considers the question for a bit and then says, yes. It does mean something, and though I tried to mask it in generalities, it is significant to my personal experiences lately. Kind of like being a teenager in general, but also more specific. I see, I say. But I don't see. I continue. 
I think I'll have to be a little more simplistic in my poem. I don't have any real deep feelings about life. I guess I do, but I don't know how to conceptualize them in a motivational way or anything like that. Well, Rachel begins, poetry doesn't have to fit any given mold. There are a lot of different styles of poetry. We've gone over the sonnet, the ballad, the elegy, the ode, the free verse, and you probably know what a limerick is. I've heard of limericks before, yes, but I wouldn't know how to write one. That's okay. I don't think a limerick would count for the assignment anyway. You should probably try free verse. You could plan for three stanzas, four lines each. They don't have to rhyme. Just tell a story. Or you could use a cu use couplets. You know those uh, when every two lines rhyme with each other, for example. <clears throat> Punctuation. Or you could use couplets. You know those when every two lines rhyme with each other. For example, I woke up this morning at 6 o'clock, and then I put on my flowery frock. Something like that. Wow, it's pretty good. You get up at 6 a.m.? Quite the early bird. Oh, and the poem example was good, too. I know that style, I say. Yep, 6 a.m., pretty much every day. That's what I do, Rachel says. So do you want some help with your poem? You want to help me write a poem? I ask. Yes, if you want me to. Or we can sit here and separately work on whatever else we have to do. I like your plan better. Let's write a poem. Sounds like Rachel and I are on the same page for this homework session. Okay, what topic do you want to write about? Rachel asks. Let's see. I want to write something new and trend-setting. Has anyone written poetry about love before? I wait for a reaction and get it in the form of a raised eyebrow and mock laughter. Okay, love has been done. I like humor. Can you help me write a funny poem? I guess, but humor isn't necessarily about the topic. It's about it's how the topic is presented, so you still need to pick a topic. <laughs> I see. Well, how about moving, I suggest. That's something both of us know about. Can we do a poem about moving and make it funny? Rachel says, well, I don't know. I think both of us are pretty negative towards moving, so maybe we can't make it funny. Good point, but let's try it out anyway. And it doesn't have to be funny. It can be whatever it ends up being. I pull out a piece of paper and click my pen. Let's get started. We get lost in time as we work on writing a poem about moving. We include imagery of leaving a familiar, comfortable location and entering a vast, unknown, strange territory. It doesn't end up funny, but we do end up sitting next to each other on the same side of the table. It was never about the homework anyway. It was never about the poem. It was about developing our relationship, pass or fail in the writing class. I'm successful in my plan for the afternoon. With a completed revised draft, we decided to call it quits and drive Rachel home. As she assembles her books and papers to stuff them in the backpack, Rachel gets a paper cut on her ring finger. Your finger is bleeding, I say. What? She exclaims. Probably a paper cut. It's amazing how, those can, how much those can bleed. You don't always even feel the cut. It just starts bleeding. I say and start to feel the effects of imagining blood. For whatever reason, I don't mind the sight of my own blood, but seeing it coming out of another person gives me the shivers. Just a heads up, I'm not good around blood. I'm not going to pass out or something, but it wigs me out a bit. Paper cut shouldn't be too bad, though. Does it hurt? I decide to stop talking about it. She puts her finger to her mouth. No, it doesn't hurt. I didn't even feel anything. I didn't bleed on the table or the homework, did I? She asks. I look around and don't see anything. No, it doesn't look like it. It's no big deal if you did. Until I get back to my homework later and find dried blood and pass out. But luckily, she won't be around to see that if it should happen. Yeah, I guess not. I just don't think it's very polite to bleed on other people's furniture. She sounds more excited over a little cut than is necessary. Maybe where you are from, but in my family, bleeding on the furniture is a sign of respect. I shake my head to show I'm just making a failed attempt at humor. She smiles, but doesn't remove her finger from her mouth. Do you need a sterile adhesive strip? I ask. A what? Band-aid, I clarify. Oh, no, I think it's fine. You ready to go? She shoulders her backpack. Yeah, I'm ready. We can head out this door. I open the kitchen door for her, and we enter the garage. I follow around to open her car door for her, and she looks at me like I'm strange. Aren't you going to drive? Rachel asks. Yeah, I intend to. <laughs> yeah, I intend to. Just wanted to open your door for you first. You're riding in the car, right? Her joke was better. Aren't you the gentleman, she says. I'm just living up to my mom's expectations. So that's what that looks like, Rachel says, and drops into her seat. Ouch. Does Rachel have an issue with her mom? I wonder if that comment was just off the cuff and meaningless, or if there's something to it. I don't think I'll ask just yet. If she has an issue with her mom, I can find out about that in due time. However, it's not really my business. I close her door after her and pass around to the driver's side. Once in the car, I hit the button for the... <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm starting to remember parts of the book that I <laughs> haven't remembered for 10 years. I don't remember a lot of this. This is fun to read. It was 14 minutes. Ahead. Sorry. Sorry for the interruption. <sighs> Let's see. Where are we? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, once in the car, I hit the button for the garage door opener and then put the key in the ignition. Rachel grabs my arm and I stop and look at her. Thank you for opening the door for me, she says sincerely. I smile. You're welcome, Rachel. She pulls her arm back and relaxes into the seat. I kick over the car and shift to reverse. As I back out, I realize Rachel reached over with her right arm. Her left ring finger received the cut. 
No, it was no longer in her mouth. Her fist was balled up and resting in her lap. Why would she reach across with her right hand and not use the hand that was closer? There's no question as to my status as conspiracy theorist and daydreamer. My mind is creative. I can't help it. It spins wildly out of control sometimes. I like to make connections, sometimes when no connections even exist. I start to make some connections now. Rachel was really sick and missed a week of school. Yesterday, she still looked really pale and sickly, but today looks remarkably better. Trent and Michael said she is sick more than most people, or when she gets sick, she seems to be worse than other people, missing a week of school at a time. No one spends time with her outside of school. I've never seen her eat any food. Her mom is a scientist doctor, which she seems to not want to discuss. Her family moved from the city to as her family moved from the city to as rural a place as you can find. And now when she gets a simple paper cut, she acts like her blood is infected and deadly. She's a vampire. Okay, maybe not a vampire, but maybe she's a hemophiliac or something blood related, which makes her feel self conscious. If she has some kind of terminal sickness, that could explain the apparent hesitancy she has in developing friendships, especially with guys. Maybe her family wanted to get her out of the rural area in the hopes of clean air picking up her health. Maybe her mom quit the CDC so she can provide specialized care, something that perhaps is a sore spot in some way, which makes Rachel hesitant to, dis hesitant to discuss it. Perhaps something in there is the reason for her comment about living up to mom's expectations. Maybe she has something contagious, and that's why she's so afraid with the blood thing right now. I hope my flippancy wasn't offensive to her, but she knows I don't know anything about it, and she seems very forgiving. Thanks for helping with my poem, I say, but it's not what I want to say. I want to find out her secret, but I know it's pretty forward and invasive for me to just ask about it. Maybe the problem Trent ran into is that he started drawing similar suspicions and asked Rachel about it before she felt she could trust him. That would make sense of the situation in my mind. I don't want to make that kind of mistake. But then she did touch my arm. Maybe she already trusts me enough to discuss it. Of course, if that's the case, then she'll bring it up when she's ready to discuss it. You're welcome. It was fun. I think you could be a good poet if you wanted to. You think quickly, and that's important in poetry. Then as though she is reading my mind... But quick thinking can also get you into trouble. So it's like Voltaire says. Voltaire, is that the fortune-telling machine in the movie Big? I ask. No, I don't think so. I don't know. I haven't seen the movie. But Voltaire was a French philosopher. The idea is that power is coupled with responsibility, she explains. Oh, that's what Spider-Man's uncle said. You should have cited Spider-Man's uncle instead of Voltron, I say. Rachel laughs. Right, I'll remember that for next time. I decide to throw caution to the wind. It seems to be working out for me these last two days. Amazing how everything, everything seems to be working out exactly how I want it to. Time to raise the stakes. Rachel, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? I don't think I can answer that completely until after I know the question you want to ask, she responds. Yes, she is very diplomatic. Good point. It's about your being sick last week. She doesn't immediately respond, so I take a quick glance at her. Her expression is blank. She is staring straight ahead out the windshield. What's on your mind, Eric? Rachel asks. I'll tell you up front that I'm operating on rumor a little bit, so please forgive me for giving any credibility to it, but I'm curious, and I think fast, like you pointed out, so maybe I'm getting into that danger zone you and Voltron are warning me about. I'm getting off track. I need to just ask. Anyway, Trent told me you seem to be sick more often than most people, and when you get sick, you're sick for a longer time, just like last week. I probably shouldn't pry, but what you had last week wasn't just the flu or something, was it? Was it? <laughs> Man, my delivery... Bad when reading out loud. It's okay. We are already passing the school, so it isn't far to Rachel's house. She could probably remain silent for the rest of the ride and then get out without saying another word. This might be it. She might never talk to me again. This might be what happened with Trent. I can't take it back now, though. I've asked the question. We can't control whether or not we hear rumors. I know that. And sometimes it is difficult to not give any attention to what we hear, she says. At least she's still talking to me for the moment. I wait for her to go on. Eric, pull over. Rachel says, oh great, it's way worse than not talking. She's going to get out and walk home. I offended her. I can feel my stomach knot up as I obey her command. I pull off onto the shoulder and shift the car into park. I'm looking straight ahead, afraid to look over and see her climbing out of the car. She isn't making any movement towards leaving. She isn't making any movement towards leaving. I look over and she's looking at me. It's a long story, she says and shrugs her eyebrows. I'd like to tell you if you want to hear it. Surprise and relief wash over me entirely. I shut off the engine and undo my seatbelt to rotate my seat and face her more directly. I do want to hear it. I'm sorry for being nosy, but I'm a curious guy. I didn't mean to impose. Rachel interrupts me. Don't worry about it. I wouldn't tell this to anyone else. I haven't told this to anyone else, but I want you to know and I want to trust you with it. I know we only met yesterday, but I feel something about you and I want you to know I want you to know this about me. I'm glad you asked. She pauses for a bit and I nod reassuringly. You'll probably end up with more questions than answers, but I'm just going to tell you everything. I'm not supposed to tell anyone, but I don't care anymore. I'm 17 years old, and I can't confide in anyone but my parents, which doesn't actually happen. Can you imagine how lonely that is? It's terrible. Of course, my telling you might put you into some minor trouble, but hopefully we can avoid that. 
This is an ab absolute secret. Do you still want to hear it? Rachel asks. A new intensity and sincerity filling her voice. Yes, power and responsibility. I got it, I say. Good, because what I've told you already is enough to get us in trouble, so I might as well tell you the rest now. A few years ago, we were living in Atlanta, and Mom was working at the CDC. Her group had a virus that was found in the heart of a jungle somewhere in South America. Brazil, I think. It was found in lizards or something. Some aspects of the virus made them think there was a way it could be modified for Alzheimer's treatment because of the interaction with the brain. They began isolating and separating emerging parts of the virus until they reached a formula that matched their goal, at least on paper. Unfortunately, an accident in the lab exposed several of the team members to the virus before they got to the point of animal testing. Well, I guess they had their animal testing then. Four members of the team were exposed. My mother was one of them. Immediately, they were quarantined. Being a virologist, Dad and I knew it was always a possibility that Mom would be quarantined without any explanation to us. We were able to talk to her on the phone, and she explained as much as she could at the time, which was that she may have been exposed to a virus. They didn't notice any symptoms or issues for three days, so they decided that the virus hadn't taken hold, although there were traces of it in their blood. Someone made the decision that there was no danger and the quarantine was canceled. Mom came home. Two days later, she got sick. She woke up early in the morning with a headache and feeling nauseated. She knew what was happening and called the office, authorizing a new quarantine expanding to anywhere the team members had been over the two days since being released. The containment unit was dispatched to each member's house. By the time the unit arrived, Mom had already vomited blood and died. Died? Is that what she just said? Rachel had started out keeping eye contact with me, but somewhere around the first mention of quarantine, her gaze wandered out the window and is now resting on her hands in her lap. I don't know what to say, so I remained silent. Mom was dead. Dad was holding in her, her in his lap on the floor in the bathroom. I had woken up from the commotion and was standing, watching, horrified and scared. <clears throat> Dad was in shock. <clears throat> I checked her pulse and... <clears throat> I don't know why I turned to the side to clear my throat as though uh, it would be rude to cough in the direction of the camera, I suppose is what that's from. Hmm. Okay. Where were we? Let's start over that paragraph. Mom was dead. Dad was holding her in his lap on the floor in a bathroom. I had woken up from the commotion and was standing watching, horrified and scared. Dad was in shock. I checked her pulse and picked up the phone lying on the floor, still connected with an emergency dispatcher at the CDC. My mom's team doesn't use 911. They have their own emergency services. When I found the line was still connected, I told the dispatcher that mom was dead. He said she wasn't breathing, and I checked her pulse and she didn't have one. I asked if I should attempt CPR or something, and he said no. He said to stay away from her and that dad and I should get away from her body, and that the decon unit was almost there. When they arrived, we were taken into the van and were taken back to the CDC and processed through a decontamination session. It was awful, but I didn't think too much about it at the time. My mom was dead, or so I thought. After several days in a hospital bed under constant observation, I was led into a sterile room where I found my mom and dad sitting at a small white plastic table. Mom was alive again. Rachel looks up and meets my eyes again. Her expression doesn't change. She just looks. I feel impelled to speak. That's heavy. She gives one of those laughs that sounds more like a sniffing sound. No kidding. So your mom was resuscitated. That's pretty amazing. Did she have one of those near-death experiences? I ask. Well, not exactly resuscitated, and she doesn't remember any kind of NDE thing where she saw a light or anything. What I learned was that mom had been taken to the same emergency location as dad and me, along with the other team members and their family members. We were all processed through decon, and then each family was admitted to their recovery quarantine unit. The families were together. Two of the team members were single, older men, but the fourth had a few kids. Their whole family was infected, just like mine. Mom said they didn't try to resuscitate her because it would have been impossible at that point, given the amount of time before the team arrived and given the danger of the virus involved. They discovered that the virus had killed Mom and that she was still dead and that her heart was no longer beating at a life-sustaining beat and her lungs were pumping very shallow and minor amounts of air through them, but the virus was animating her body and her body seemed to be alive. My mom was a zombie, and shortly after our little reunion, the virus took its toll on me and my dad and we became zombies too. All right. That's, that was a interesting chapter to read. I might, I don't know, I don't want to keep too much commentary out of these these videos, just make them about reading, but that made me think about some things. Cool. All right. Well, that's chapter six. And uh, stay tuned next week for chapter seven, which is called Your Neck. Thanks for listening. Bye.